Hello everyone, uh, today I'll be giving a talk on PyPy. Okay, so the PyPy repo that, strangely enough, can be found on Bitbucket actually contains two major components in it. So the first one is a dynamic language implementer framework, and the second is a Python implementation using this framework. Uh, probably you are thinking right now, like, um, so this interpretation topic seems to be very programming language specific, right? And you probably don't do that. Like, why should you care? Uh, there is a famous joke that goes like that. Um, any sufficiently complicated program contains an ad hoc, informally specified, buggy, and slow implementation of Lisp. And honestly, I'm not sure about Lisp, though I do believe that any complex computation being properly decomposed is indeed looks and quacks like an implementation of certain domain-specific uh, language runtime, so to speak. So, say you have been given with a simple expression like a times b plus c, and you're asked to evaluate this expression using just a set of functions that you've been provided with uh, in advance. Their actual implementation doesn't really matter, but for the sake of argument, let's assume that um, these are kind of binary operators, like binary multiply, binary add, etc. Uh, you will probably come up with something that looks pretty much like the code on this slide, right? So nothing very fancy, super simple. Uh, I've just rewritten previous version using marvelous means of variables in Python. Uh, mind how this multiplication result variable is being reused as an argument for a binary add function. So still nothing fancy, though there is a subtle detail to it. Current implementation silently implies an existence of some implicit state. In Python repo session, such state is represented by the uh, global scope of the Dunder main Dunder module. So what if the state is required to be explicit? Uh, can we still do that? Again, no problem. Let's assume that there is some kind of container type which instance being pre-built and given to us in advance. Now binary functions obtain their input from the state object, and what is new to that version is that functions are not allowed to return anymore. Instead, the computation result is somehow being shoved back to the state. So see how these binary functions share their results uh, through this uh, state object. For instance, binary multiplications assigns its result to state.anything which is later uh, used by binary add function to perform an addition operation. For the sake of simplicity, let's define container type to be just a standard Python list type, and let's treat this list as a stack. So stacks naturally have two operations associated to them, a push that shows the value to the stack and pop that removes the value from the top of the stack. Okay, on this slide, uh, I've issued the code in a form of a function. Mm, does this look any familiar to you? Uh, function's body looks very much like a small stack-based machine program, represented as a plain list of simple instructions. Uh, the function itself plays a role of uh, kind of evaluation facility that runs the stack machine code. Uh, the implementation has a couple of problems, though. The first one is that the code itself and the eval function are kind of uh, tightly coupled. So basically you can see that this is in fact just a single function, right? To highlight the problem, just imagine that there is a remote client who actually okay with the subject area of mathematical expressions represented in terms of stack-based abstraction. On the other side of the wire, there is a server that runs Python interpreter and have these handler functions implemented in Python. So how would you establish the communication between this non-Pythonic client and server? Well, uh, for web, we usually implement serialization layer and organize the architecture in, say, restful manner. So the communication protocol should look like this. The client generates a list of stack-based instructions from the expression he is interested in and dumps this list to JSON. Server loads this JSON back to the list of operations 
converts this list to Python function where each operation being substituted with its implementation in, uh, in Python yeah, and runs the function. And this is pretty much it. And the Levit tunnel just described workflow is quite close to the actual implementation pattern for interpreted dynamic languages. So, okay, this ser serialization layer um, solves coupling, I guess, right? And there is way worse thing we should be aware of. And the name for this thing is irremovable polymorphism. Um, yeah. So as you can see, any value on this stack can play a role of the argument for an arbitrary handler function. So even though in this simple example shown on the slide, the interpreter can in fact infer types for um, each call site, that won't really help much since handler uh, signatures are usually statically typed for performance reasons. So this circumstance becomes the cause of necessity for so-called value, box, uh, value boxing uh, before being processed by any stack machine uh, facility. It, each value should be put to the special box, uh, some kind of you know, wrapper that would fit to the handler uh, signature. So this value boxing leads to a vast variety of different overheads, both related to memory footprint and performance. So believe it or not, a good enough solution has something to do with the, an idea of partial evaluation. I'm pretty sure that you guys are somewhat familiar with the partial evaluation basics, at least with the implementation from the Python's functals library. So the interface is somewhat trivial, just show your function and a uh, set of arguments to this partial object and you will be given back with a new callable that accepts uh, only those arguments that not being defaulted. So the um, mental model that is crucial here is that partial function sort of eliminates the function and static data it being applied to, making a new callable that is simpler, you know, at least uh, signature wise. So the uh, degree of such simplification depends purely on the um, uh, implementation of the partial function. Say mentioned uh, functals one does not do any simplification as you probably know. So you're probably asking yourself how this weird you know game applies to dynamic languages and that is that is good question yeah. Say you have written yourself some Lua runtime which is implemented as a Pythonic function. So this Lua code and data arguments are intended to be directly passed to the Lua runtime function. Yet in order to run the former, you actually have to have a working Python interpreter, which is represented as a function called Python. Like what if there was a awesome partial functions brother uh, let's call him magic, that being applied to Python runtime and Lua runtime gives the Lua runtime version Lua exclamation mark that not only seems to be abstracted from the Python runtime, but that is indeed free from any Python code whatsoever. For instance, Lua exclamation mark can be just a binary. So it turns out that this magic thing is actually implemented as a R Python toolchain. So how awesome is that? It's pretty awesome, I think. Uh, so yeah, case study. Uh, I want to show you how this uh, magic partial evaluation works on a simple example. Let's refer to the stuff we all know and love, the Python itself. We'll see how uh, evaluator that being powered with uh, some street magic shrinks a simple yet not quite trivial function all the way down to the pure nothingness. Um, now on this slide I'm showing you an implementation of uh, ABS function. It has a simple compare operation that operates on dynamically typed variable named value and a multiplication of the value thing on a simple negative one constant. Also there is a simple branch condition. So again, nothing fancy, yet please mind that there is no static type information associated to this value thing. So in reality, this computation is somewhat non-trivial at all. Uh, as I told you, uh, in reality, interpreted languages uh, runtime never sees the high-level code. Instead, they expect a serialized version to be provided. So the code 
uh, as a text string that being serialized by the Python compiler is represented as a bunch of uh, code object instances. So these code objects are rather complex inside, yet roughly can be thought as a plain list of um, simple stack machine instructions. So again, roughly speaking, this code uh, on this slide is just a stack-based representation for the, ABS uh, for the ABS function on the previous slide. And this is roughly how the eval function should look like. At least in C Python's implementation, it uh, looks pretty much like that. The implementation on current slide has a couple of uh, differences from what I have shown you at first few slides. Like first, uh, it takes something called frame instead of code object. So this is just an implementation detail, nothing to be bothered with. Also, um, you have probably noticed that there is a huge while loop that has a ton of if else stuff inside it. So again, nothing new really. Yeah. So this is just a code deserialization called dynamic opcode dispatch that is done uh, at the program runtime, not in advance for the sake of performance. Also, we should not forget about boxing issue. Uh, do you remember that? So each value must be wrapped with some sort of container that tags the value with its type and uh, but basically with a ton of other valuable information. Uh, I have tried to model this boxing issue with the uh, simple you know, inheritance tree. The basic type implements the boxing facility itself, so it stores the value as a low-level value attribute. Subclasses uh, kind of you know, tags the value with the type information. Like for, now, for instance, this long object uh, stores somewhat like integer inside it, and bools uh, are suitable for uh, you know bool objects. So I, I hope you get the gist. So remember how this magic function being applied to the Python runtime itself and interpreted zero function um, gave us this uh, interpret one function that um, acts exactly like interpret zero one yet does not contain any Python inside it. I would expect that the same process should give us ABS function that acts exactly like uh, and serialized ABS code being interpreted with this eval frame function, but sort of without the actual eval frame function in it. So in other words, the interpretation should be magically vanished. This can be achieved in two steps. Consider step one, get rid of the dynamic dispatch. So basically I've just substituted each opcode with its implementation and got that. So nothing fancy indeed. You're probably asking yourself, is the implementation any better than the previous one? Uh, I would say that yes, at least there is no dispatch loop left in it. The redundant stuff that is left uh, is an actual stack-based computation model. So see, first we have built ourselves a stack instance colored with green, uh, and now we are trying to follow the argument passing protocol. Uh, all the, uh, you know, push and pop operations you are seeing. So this protocol was a necessity for a dynamic dispatched version that uh, we don't have anymore. So let's go ahead and throw the stack away. So this would be uh, our step two optimization. So we get this ABS function with no opcode dispatch and state management overhead, yet still there is a um, faint echo from the times where when this function was an interpreter. And I'm talking about a couple of handler functions, the compare one, uh, greater or equal, and a do multiplication one. So um, usually deep inside that kind of functions are very dependent on the operands type. So for instance, uh, the do multiplication function checks uh, if two operands have uh, the same type, long object type, then if so, the result should be uh, just a long object with a low-level value that uh, just equals to the multiplication of low-level value values from the corresponding operands. So on this slide, we see the ABS function with handler functions being inlined according to the assumption that the external value that comes from the stack has a type of long object. 
now we can see that there is even more redundancy to this code. So see how first low-level comparisons being computed and wrapped with a bool object instance and being un unwrapped back to the low-level value on the next line. So we notice that only after the um, after that uh, comparison functions being inlined, before that this information was hidden. Okay, got rid from the bool object constructor. We still have this pesky if-else branch. The only way to eliminate that is to rebuild the code in some assumption about the sign of the input value. That can be thought as an additional invocation of magic function. Let's say, the, uh, let's say that the uh, input value was negative. Uh, that would mean that the yellow part of the function uh, is now useless and could be thrown away, right? So just eliminate the whole yellow part. What we left with is a fully tailored version of the interpreter, right? So it extracts value from a frame and uh, basically immediately yields back another long object that represents the result of the ABS function being computed on the original value. So like no interpretation, no code dispatch, like nothing. But the uh, very essence of the algorithm is still there in this function. So it's, it's pretty awesome. So, quick recap. Dynamic languages are very different from the static ones. So you can, in fact, go ahead and implement a uh, simple dynamic language like in a super short period of time, um, in a couple of weekends, I guess. Yet achieving a performance is a very different story. Uh, the performance comes with a dynamic interpreter adaptation in a manner shown in this uh, presentation. So remember, language design is fun and also with the means of RPython toolchain is not a very complicated problem. So you should probably give it a try. So thank you for your time and have a nice bike on Singapore. Bye.